So today when I got home from work, uh, Vienna, our seven-year-old, runs up to me and she says, Dad, I made you an early Father's Day card. And so she brings me this beautiful handmade, stapled together, colored in, just says, Dear Dad, I love you so much. And you are the best dad ever. Love V. Um, and she loves art. So there's just warmed my heart. Um, and as I stepped inside of the house, um, I just couldn't help but think about that phrase, you're the best dad ever, and feeling like, well, I'm, of course, I'm the only dad you've ever known. And just, if I'm being honest, there's moments where um, I, I wrestle with that present um, state of where I am right now as a dad, and this, these desires I had as a young, uh, kid thinking, man, I'm going to be the best dad ever. And there's days that I feel like I'm on top of it. And there's days that I know I fall way short. And today being Father's Day, I know is filled with so many emotions. For some of you, this is a day to celebrate. You have an amazing dad. Some of you, this is a day to remember your dad who's gone to be with the Lord. And you, you grieve and you remember the gift that he was. Some of us, this is a painful day. This is a day that we long for the dad we never knew. Uh, for some of us, this is a day filled with gratitude for the spiritual fathers in our life. But regardless where this day lands in your own heart, one thing that has become more and more apparent to me the longer that I've been pastoring, the longer that I've been embedded in this community, is that there is a crisis on our hands when it comes to the role and the vitality of fathers, both physical, biological fathers and also spiritual fathers. And I just have this deep sense that the Spirit of God is wanting to breathe afresh and anew into the hearts of men. And so my hope is that today would not just be a sermon for dads, and it wouldn't even necessarily just be a sermon for men but for men to feel encouraged and equipped and also for there to be a level of clarity and encouragement uh, for the women as well. But the, re the text that I'm drawn to today comes from a letter that Paul wrote to a church in Corinth. There's a series of these letters going back and forth and in the beginning of this opening letter, he's addressing this very real threat of division. Essentially, uh, this church that Paul helped start has picked their favorite celebrity apostle, if you could believe that, and have created different camps within Christianity to say, well, we're with this one, and we're with this one, and we're with this one. And Paul spends four chapters just saying Christ isn't divided and pointing people back to Jesus. But he has this moment at the end of this section that has always captured my imagination. It's, it's drawn me in as a son, as a father, as someone who wants to make a spiritual impact on others. He says, I'm writing this not to shame you, but to warn you as dear children. The, the warning being this divisiveness that's going on. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. That sentence right there is alluding to this, this Greek word guardian, is referencing this role that wealthy Corinthians had that was kind of our modern day of, of, of a tutor or an, even a nanny. or someone who would care for children but was also responsible for training them up. And he says, you have 10,000 of these, these guardians. He says, you have very few fathers. I became a father to you. What strikes me about that is at this point in Paul's ministry, he's not married. We don't have any history of him having any children. And whether his wife passed away or whether she left him at his radical conversion to following the way of Jesus, as far as we know, this is a single man. And yet he inserts himself in the story of the Corinthians saying, I became your father. And this is the description he gives. Therefore, since I am your spiritual father through the gospel, I urge you to imitate me. 
For this reason I have sent you Timothy, my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. So I love this. Not only does Paul just say, this is my role in your life, but he's so confident in it that he says, imitate me. This is my role as a, a father is not just to do as I say, but to do as I do. But he's very quick to point out the imitation that's supposed to come through my spiritual fathership is I am living out the way of Jesus. And I just long, I yearn to be able to have that sort of confidence with my four kids, with the the people in my life who I have the privilege to help lead and, and, and influence in a spiritual sense, is that I would have not confidence in myself, like, man, look how good I'm doing, but rather I can step into that space of, of giving, of inviting to imitate me, not because I'm great, but because I have been so consumed by the life of Jesus. But I think that when I hear that, the reason that sounds so refreshing is I don't hear that very often. Matter of fact, hardly ever. And I, my hope is that maybe there's some men watching this, that the Holy Spirit would just prompt you, would call you up. And maybe if, if you're a woman watching this and there's a, there's a man in your life, you'd use this to encourage him. That there is this sense of God wanting to reclaim spiritual fathers through the gospel in this season of our culture and of our church. Why? Well, because we're in a crisis. We're in a crisis because we are living in this time with this ambiguity of what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be masculine? What does it mean to be a father? And some of that is built because of uh, the social and psychological deconstruction that's happened in the past 100 years, specifically the past 30 to 40 years of how for so many years, for millennia, there was this hierarchy of men and women. And that was largely because we lived in agrarian societies where men being physically stronger would go and work in the fields and women would watch children at home. And after the Industrial Revolution and women started working within the workplace, within factories, those lines started to be blurred and then come the eve of the, te of the technological revolution. All of a sudden, it doesn't take extra strength to type on a computer. Ma matter of fact, the emotional intelligence and the intellect that women possess have continued to allow them to rise in places of leadership. All of which we see Jesus celebrating the gospels. He celebrates the elevation of women. But I think with our culture, as they've tried to elevate women, there has also been simultaneously this disregard and even this sense of uh, kind of putting men in a negative sense and not wanting to go back to some unhealthy hierarchy. I think a lot of men are just, we're just confused. What, what is it to be a man, to be a father, to be a spiritual father? And how do we, take the biblical, true, good principles, and at the same time, not just go and say, we need to go back to how it was, because there's so much about an unhealthy culture and what they did with patriarchy that doesn't need to come back. But my hope is that we would look at the scriptures today, specifically the author of that text I just read, Paul, as a case study for what does it mean to have a biblical framework for to be a man, which led him into being able to say, I am a spiritual father. So I hope that you hear what I'm saying. The, in my hope to bring clarity and encouragement to biblical masculinity and to spiritual fathers, it is in no way to say we need to go back to some sort of ancient cultural patriarchy, but rather it is to renew and recover what the Bible has always said is good and true about men, which will always compliment and come, come alongside what is good and true about women. So this, if you were to ask me, what are the, the four things that I, that I see in my limited view, this is not an exhaustive list, that are, that, is, that are crises that are facing men today, they would be these four things. Number one, that there's a crisis of confidence. And by the way, these four crises that I'm gonna be talking about 
are not a crisis because men lack these things, but rather they are misplaced. So the first one is that there's a crisis of confidence where men have an overconfidence in some things because they lack confidence in sometimes truer things. And so there's a temptation to be like, well, I'm going to be the best at this. I'm going to pour my life into my, my work or my this or my hobby or this fitness thing. And all the while, when it comes to things like the gospel and the kingdom of God, there's a lack of confidence. Number two, there's a crisis of isolation. You see, for, for millennia, people lived in tribes. They lived in community. And since the industrial and now the technological revolution, we have celebrated individuality, which has only perpetuated man's temptation to isolate. And I see this a crisis in our society right now. Men think it's, it's manly not to need help, not to ask for help. And so all of a sudden they lack confidence in areas they need confidence, but they don't know how to go and find it because they find themselves isolated. Now, that doesn't mean they don't have friends. They, sometimes they have tons of friends. They don't know how to be honest with them though. They don't know how to be real with them. They don't know how to be raw with them. They just don't know how to be real with them. Third crisis, I believe is a crisis of conviction that because we don't know where our convictions lie, we choose the most strange and unconsequential hills to die on. Our convictions lie so much stronger in our allegiance to a sports team or into a political party. And when it comes to our conviction to the word of God and to the kingdom of God, we falter. Next, there's a crisis of longevity that there are men filled with inspiration and ambition, but the longer they live this life that they always thought they wanted, they find themselves weary and exhausted. So again, just these four crises that are facing men today is confidence, isolation, conviction, and longevity. And I'm here to just tell you today that the solution is within the crucified and resurrected Christ. And you might be like, that's, that's too simple. What do you mean by that? Well, let's go back to our case study today in the person of Paul. Paul was elite. He was zealous. He was the leader, the CEO, the young and up and coming person to watch in the Jewish Forbes magazine 2000 years ago. And, and, and in his intellect and his zeal and his education and his affluence, all of a sudden his life got flipped upside down when he met the cross, when he met the crucified and resurrected Jesus and everything changed. I don't, I don't know if you realize this, but Paul had those same uh, crises in his own life. You see, Paul had the wrong kind of confidence. You see, Paul, although he didn't live in an individualistic society, was isolated in thinking his own world fit within his ethnocentric uh, sense of reality. It was only about the Israelites, and he had no framework for God's heart for the rest of the world, even though it was in his sacred texts. Paul had a crisis of conviction. He was convicted so strongly about certain things that he would put people to death, yet lacked the conviction of mercy and justice. And lastly, the crisis of longevity he had is when he turned, is we see that when he met Jesus, he lived his entire life unwavering from his mission. So I think Paul's a great case study as just a man, as a spiritual father, as someone who had these same, a version of these same crises that he's facing, and that Jesus radically changed him. And so we, we might be like, well, how did he change? How did Paul change? In, in the framework of these four things. Here, here they are. When Paul was, was struggling with the wrong placed confidence, what Jesus did is he clarified his identity. This is number one. Matter of fact, let me read you the four antidotes, the four solutions that I believe the Spirit of God and the Word of God speaks to today. It's clarified identity, covenant community, cruciform servanthood, and courageous endurance. If, man, if you could get these four 
things and by get let the Holy Spirit work these in you. These are all biblical truths from the Spirit of God through the mouth of Paul. Clarified identity, covenant community, cruciform servanthood, and courageous endurance. So number one, when Paul's confidence was misplaced, Jesus doesn't come and just steer his zeal. He comes and changes his whole identity. You see, when we have a clear sense of our sonship in God and our heavenly father, all of a sudden our confidence shifts when we know what our dad thinks of us. Think about Paul's conversion. There's a man that the Lord woke up in a dream called Ananias and told him to go to Paul. At that time, his name was Saul and he was killing Christians on his way to go in and to wipe out this strange Jewish sect that he was thought was antithetical to his Hebrew Bible. It says, Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priest. There's that confidence, right? The authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, I love this, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings to the people of Israel. I love that. And I says, do you know who this guy is? The confidence and the authority that he has that is misplaced, that's corrupt. And Jesus speaking to Ananias, he says, I have chosen this man as my instrument. If you're listening, maybe you're on the on the couch with your wife, maybe you're driving alone in your car. Can I just tell you your confidence will always predicate on where your identity lies. You need a clarification of whose you are and of what Jesus has said about you. And when that comes, you begin to start changing your confidence rather than just trying to do things that are temporal, things that are even maybe harmful, to things that are, are eternal, things that are praiseworthy and beautiful. The second thing, is that when there's a crisis of isolation, I think God is calling us to covenant community. This is what 1 Corinthians, the first four chapters are all about. He's just coming and saying, stop dividing. You are a covenant community, meaning you are brought together in the body of Christ. What brings you together is so much stronger than what should be separating to you. This is why he says in the first chapter, verse 10, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but you're perfectly united in mind and thought. He says it again in his letter to the Philippians. He says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ and any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit and any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. I, I, Paul, again and again in these letters, he is the who used to be the instrument of division, is now calling people under Christ to a cross-shaped unity. And I, I just think that this is so significant, specifically to men in our society today. Some of us know how to have a couple of buddies. Some of us have a family but do we know what it means like to live in covenant community? And what that requires of us, and I already said this, is we're so good at being raw, right? We can, we can go and joke and, and, and just and hang out, but we're really poor at being real. And that's what this is describing, this idea of having one spirit, one heart, sharing the same mind. I wanna encourage you, who in your life actually knows you? And, and more importantly, do they know you enough to call you up and not just call you out? Mark Batterson's got a great book called Play the Man. And he has this insight about his role as a pastor, which is very similar just to being a spiritual father. He says, one of the biggest mistakes I made as a young leader was trying to make everyone comfortable. But in the long run, that doesn't do anybody any favors. I've since redefined my job description as pastor. My job is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. 
and the latter is not less loving than the former. It's more so. Comforting the afflicted is love. Afflicting the comfortable is tough love. It is so much easier just to avoid conflict, isn't it? So we delay discipline, but in the long run that hurts more than it helps. Or we postpone tough conversations because we lack the emotional energy or courage. What would it look like to live in a brotherhood, to live with other couples, other friends, people in your life who would look at you and say, hey, I'm going to comfort you when you're afflicted, but when you're comfortable, I'm not afraid to come and afflict you. I'm not to come to, to call you up, right? A brother is born for adversity. I cannot express how thankful I am for the men in my life who love me enough to bring me comfort, but also bring me correction. That's not everyone. So if you're watching this, you're like, great, I'm just going to be that guy. There's a circle of men in my life I've intentionally gone to. I said, can I be completely honest with you? They're the guys that I send text messages to when I'm short-tempered with my kids and when I'm not loving towards my wife. And they're the guys who say, I love you, but let's keep, let's keep going towards who God has called you to be. And this is exactly what the church was always meant to be. It's not just a gathering. It's, it's definitely not just something we watch online. The, the church is a community of people, and that can look a lot of different ways and a lot of different shapes. But ultimately, it is a group of people who we live life together that are pointing us towards Christ. Listen to what Michael Gorman, his book, his book Reading Paul, says. What Paul has in mind is a group of diverse people who have been apprehended by the resurrected, crucified Messiah justified, crucified, and occupied, and who live together as a distinctive, even countercultural community in Him. And I would just encourage you, like live within that community. And the last two are this. Number three, I believe that the crisis we're facing of con a crisis of conviction is solved when we allow our convictions to line up with the cross, meaning that we now have what's called a cruciform, the shape of a cross, a cruciform servanthood. That verse we just read in, in Philippians that talks about how we are to live in such a way with one another that looks like Christ. He then goes on and describes, this is the attitude that Christ had. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That is not just a description of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's an invitation. We are invited as men and women. And men, I'm specifically just, I'm wanting to just speak into your life today that we are called to cruciform servanthood. And we live in a society that wants to convince you that the better life is, is the more comfortable you become. And what the gospel is saying is, no, 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 no. The cross was not an event that we get to look back upon. The cross is a, is a road we walk down. It's the invitation of Jesus Christ to say, live like me. Live, live in such a way that's shaped by the cross, who serves and lays down his life. It's why Paul says in Ephesians, love your wife the way I love the church. But this is how we is, is to mark our every single day. And I just think that there's some men who are tired and think that you've loved long enough, you've served long enough. And can I say, we're never done being shaped by the cross. We're never done living in a servant-hearted way. This is, this is our call, this side of heaven, is to serve one another. Why? Well, because you've been served by Jesus Christ in His mercy. Again, Michael Gorman in his book says, Paul does not see this response to the gospel of Christ's death and res resurrection merely as an intellectual affirmation 
or even simply as an act of trust in the efficacy of those events. Rather, Paul sees faith as sharing in the death of Jesus that's so real, so vivid, that it can be described as being crucified with Christ or co-crucified. You ever think about that? That sometimes following Jesus looks like being co-crucified, crucified with Christ. And so if you're watching this, it's like, man, you have no idea how hard it is, is to love and serve uh, my, my wife, my kids, my boss, my employees, my whoever, day in and day out. I'm not trying to call out how hard things are. What I'm calling us back to is the cross. We are called to live in a way of serving others the way Jesus has served us, that you never graduate from that. It's always what we're called to do. It's what I'm called to do. And can I just be the first one to say this? If you're, if there's a temptation to start feeling guilty right now, I'm not anywhere close to this. Just because I'm sharing this and I'm encouraging you with some, some pointed strength does not mean that I'm saying this from a point of mastery. I'm saying this to us. We must continue to pick up our cross. And yes, salvation is finished. We have been justified by His grace, but we are also invited to daily love people around us in a cruciform, servant-hearted way. And the last one is this. I think one of the saddest crises that I've come across that, that plague men is a crisis of longevity. And I think what's so sad about it is that I've never met a man who entered into marriage thinking it would fail. I never, I never met a man entering into a job thinking that he would uh, do things that were immoral. I never met a man who set out to fail. It's rarely something wrong with his intention or his ambition. It's, it's, it's something about his endurance, his perseverance, something about my endurance. And there's something about those moments when we have gone as hard and long as we could that we feel like giving up. A two, we have two options in those moments. One, we can throw in the towel and see, I guess I'm not as strong as I thought I was going to be. Or we can get on our knees and say, Jesus, I'm not as strong as I thought I was. I was prideful and arrogant and thinking I could do this on my own. I cannot, but I do not want to give up. Give me strength. And you start going backwards, right? You start going backwards into help me regain a heart for serving. Help me get back into real community. I'm not just talking about going to a Sunday, Sunday school class or even a small group. I'm talking about going into deep, real community. I, God, help me renew my identity because I think there's so many men watching this right now and you're just like, I've, I've heard these things. I get it. I, maybe I'm supposed to be better. But if that's your takeaway, you're not getting it. The takeaway is that in the moments that we have failed, we remember that Jesus has covered all of that. That's what gives us the endurance as we wait on the Lord that He'll renew our strength. And I just want to in invite every single father, spiritual father, mentor, every man, and, and honestly, a, a, every woman who feels exhausted, that you'd have renewed strength as you watch this. I just want to read Romans 5 over you. It says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Though we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know, listen to this, that our sufferings produce perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. And I look at that, that line that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character hope. And I think the problem is that word perseverance. Suffering can be so intense that all of a sudden perseverance doesn't feel like the best option. And can I just encourage you today, it's always worth it. Why? Well, because if you keep persevering, you will only grow in character. When you give up on persevering, you have given up not only on your character, but the hope that follows it. 
It's worth it. Keep going. It's worth, your marriage is worth fighting for. Your kids are worth fighting for. Your character is worth fighting for. And even though you've fallen down, Proverbs says a righteous man falls down seven times, but gets back up again. This is your moment to say, no matter how far I feel back, I'm not going to give up because the minute you stand back up is the minute you are still persevering. The minute you are still moving closer towards your character, which will reveal hope that does not disappoint. This has to be our call from the Holy Spirit. Remember, we stand in His grace. So as we stand in His grace, we will always have enough to get back up again, to continue to persevere. Jonathan Edwards says, the way to heaven is ascending. We must be content to travel uphill, though it be hard and tiresome and contrary to the natural bias of our flesh. The way to heaven is ascending. We must be content to travel uphill. Recently, a friend of mine, Jason Graves, he's the pastor at Daybreak Church, He's like, hey, you want to come trail running with me? And I said, that sounds awful. Um, I like running on flat ground by the beach. Just like, that's the only kind of running I like. He's like, no, you're going to love it. So he invites me out on the trail. And as we're going up the trail, he stops me and he says, you're running too fast. I'm like, what do you mean? He says, if you run like that up these hills, you're not going to make it. And I realized that the problem wasn't the mountain I was trying to ascend, it was the pace that I was trying to run. And so some of us need to lean back into the Heavenly Father, stop beating ourselves up into transformation, and let His kindness lead us to repentance, to get back up, and to remember that He has given us clarity on our identity. He's given us the, the gift of covenant community. Right, that He has called us to cruciform servanthood, not, not demanding anything other than what He's already given us. And lastly, He's inviting us to courageous endurance. Those hills might seem tall. Don't give up. Continue to go. Continue to fight the good fight of faith. Because as you do, as the Holy Spirit empowers you, and the finished work of Christ compels you, that you would just continue to look back and you would see your character and your hope having been developed through your perseverance that you had in suffering. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, in a, in a day and age that it feels hard to know what it means to be a spiritual father, a physical father, a husband, a man, and on a day that's filled with all sorts of emotions, God, as we talked about this expectation that apart from you is impossible, Lord, we thank you that your patience is perfect. And Lord, we ask that you just continue to call us towards who we were always meant to be. Lord, we love you so much. I pray you would bless every single dad out there. Fill them with your spirit. And I pray for the spiritual dads who have yet to realize that they're a spiritual dad to start walking in a, such a way that they could say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.